Well, happy Mother's Day if you're a first-time mom or you're a seasoned veteran at this thing. Uh, we hope that today is an awesome day. Um, I don't know if you remember last year, um, it downpoured on Mother's Day. Do anybody remember that? It was pouring to the point where people didn't, chose to like wait out after service here because it was raining so hard. Or their husbands, like me, maybe didn't want to go get the car in the rain. Well, probably is that too. So, But either way... Uh, Rain or shine, we're, we're praying that this is a great day for you. Uh, today's a day to be thankful. Today's a day to, to celebrate. Today's a day to remember and honor our, our moms and our grandmas and, and any uh, lady who has had a motherly influence on your life. And so today we're so thankful for them. Uh, they truly see the best in us, don't they? They see the best in us. Uh, if you've ever had a moment in life where you're thinking, man, I wish I could see from their vantage point. I, I wish I could see this situation from their perspective. Um, maybe it's, you know, a, a famous athlete that you wish, I, could, I wish I could see the moment from their perspective, or I, I wish I could see from a politician's standpoint in this perspective how they're seeing it. Or maybe, maybe you've, you've ventured out and you thought, what is Pastor Weaver thinking right now, right? Like, I wish I could see it the way he sees it. We love you. What's that? Come on now, okay. Are you saying preach it or keep going? <laughs> okay. But what if, what if we could see life and situations from a mother's vantage point? Now, come on, guys. You know this would save you a lot, right? This would help you from a lot of conversations. Kids, this would save us a lot of heartache if we could just see situations from our mother's vantage point. Well, I think there is a solution for all of us. Watch this video. Warning, use of this product may alter your perception of reality. Everything looks the same. Guys, can somebody hit me with some juice? And listen, Paul, no Paul, doesn't make a difference to me. You're the ones dealing with the diaper. Mom goggles. <laughs> Have fun glamping. What is that? I have no idea. Huh. We got this. Yep. I mean, think about this. The kids are older. Now they practically take care of themselves. <laughs> Nobody understands me. We're doomed. What did we do the last time they left us alone with the kids? <laughs> Mom goggles! Those things were so great. I mean, they helped us see things like moms see things. Whatever happened to them? I definitely put them in a place I knew I would never forget. Great. Where are they? I forgot. Uh, computer phone. Order two pair of mom goggles. Ordering two pairs of mom joggers. <laughs> nope. Uh, no. Goggles. Mom goggles. <laughs>
you're feeling is natural. You truly are a gift from God. And I hope you know I'm always here for you. You're the best dad in the world. I'm sorry I don't tell you that more often. I am going to cry like a man child at your wedding. <laughs> Look at this mess. It is literally a pigsty in here, mister. How are you going to organize your life if you can't organize your sock drawer? First, it's unmatched socks. Then, unfinished homework. Then, kicked out of school. Next, <gasps> jail. <laughs> How does she process this every day? All right, one more time. Plastic bowls up top, face down, forks up, knives down, plates in the center, pots and pans we wash by hand. Now repeat it back to me. No, I don't think the joggers make you look fat. I've got my dad's thighs. <laughs> Don't you need the goggles? Yeah. I've seen your mom do this so many times. You have a great mom, you know that. That's great. Mm. Can you hand me the barf bucket? No, okay, here, here we go. <laughs> uh, <coughs> I got your cat out of the dryer. You're welcome. I don't know the cat. How do they do it? Cats? Moms. How do they do all of this without the goggles? They don't need them. <laughs> Moms have this God-given ability. Yeah, it's like no matter what the circumstance, they always see the best version of what their kids can be. Moms are a little glimpse of heaven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How many of you can relate to any one of those situations? Yes. Oh, moms, we love you so much. Oh, how many of you would say your mom taught you at least something in life, right? You, at least one thing she has taught you. Uh, I remember distinctly, I probably have shared this before in a sermon, but there was one day I must have been mouthy to my mom, and she, for those of you who, who knew her, she babysat for 30-some years. Uh, just in-home daycare. So uh, we grew up and we just had tons of kids in our house all the time. And I must have been pretty mouthy because she put me, she put me in the playpen as probably late elementary kid. You know, I'm sitting in a playpen while the, the parents are coming to pick up the kids and they're walking past me. I was so, oh man, she taught me very quickly. You don't mouth off to mom. So uh, anyways, moms have taught us so much. Uh, my mother, I read this from someone uh, the other day, my mother taught me to appreciate a job well done. If you're going to hurt each other, do it outside because I just finished cleaning. <laughs> my mother taught me about prayer. She says, you better pray that that will come out of the carpets. My mother, she taught me about time travel. If you don't straighten up, I'm going to knock you into the middle of next week. <laughs> my mother taught me about, about logic because I said so, that's why. My mother taught me about foresight. Make sure that you wear clean underwear in case you're in a car accident. <laughs> My mother taught me about irony. Keep crying and I'll give you something to cry about. <laughs> My mother taught me about the science of osmosis. Shut up and eat your supper. <laughs> My mother taught me about stamina. You're going to sit there until all that spinach is gone. My mother taught me about the weather. Your room looks like a tornado went through it. My mother taught me the circle of life. I brought you into this world. I can take you out. Yes. Ah, you guys have been told that too. 
My mother taught me about behavior modification. Stop acting like your father. <laughs> My mother taught me about anticipation. Just wait until we get home. My mother taught me about receiving. You're going to get it when we get home. My mother taught me medical science. If you don't stop crossing your eyes, the wind is going to change and you're going to stay like that. My mother taught me how to become an adult. If you don't eat your vegetables, you're never going to grow up. My mother taught me about my roots. Shut the door behind you. Do you think you were born in a barn? My mother taught me wisdom. When you get to be my age, you'll understand. And finally, my mother taught me about justice. One day you'll have kids, and I hope they turn out just like you, right? Our moms have taught us so much. So this week, if you're able to, or even today, um, if you have the opportunity to let your mom know of something that she taught you, something that you're thankful for, um, it's a great day. We, we truly love you, moms. So today, as we celebrate and we honor moms, I do want to look at uh, a biblical perspective, a biblical example of, of a mom's influence on a child's life. And so I have titled today's message, A Mother's Influence. But in order for me to not have to balance out every statement about moms and Mother's Day moving forward in this message, I'm going to say this now, that this message is for everybody, all right? So whether you're a, a mother, a father, a son, a daughter, um, this message is for all of us. Yes, we celebrate our moms today, but at the end of the day, uh, this applies to us. So we've all been influenced or impacted by our mom in one way or another. In just a moment, we're going to get to 2 Timothy. So if you have your Bible, you can turn there. We'll get there in a few short minutes. So we're going to look at a biblical example of a motherly's influence upon somebody's life. So Timothy, in the Bible, uh, Paul writes to him. He writes two specific books to encourage him, to challenge him as, as um, a leader, as a pastor, as a missionary. Um, and Timothy was really influenced, greatly influenced by the Apostle Paul. And uh, so take time, sec First and Second Timothy, they're great books, they're short, you can read them real quick. Uh, but Paul, you know, he's an apostle, he's teaching, he's preaching, he's on missionary journeys, he's discipling Timothy, and even in First Timothy chapter 1 verse 2, Paul calls Timothy his son in the faith. So that says a lot about their connection, their relationship, their mentorship that Paul has upon Timothy. And so by the time that we get to 2 Timothy, Paul is on trial in Rome, and he mentions later on in the book that he is nearing the end. He realizes that he has fought a good fight, and so whatever is about to happen, he understands that the end is coming for him. And, but Paul, very quickly at the beginning of 2 Timothy, um, recognizes who it was that had a, a profound impact on Timothy's life. Yes, it was Paul. There is there. But long before Paul, there were years of godly influence on Timothy's life by two women who set him in the direction that he needed to go. So 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 5, let's read it. It says, I've been reminded, this is Paul speaking to Timothy, I've been reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded it now lives also in you. So Grandma Lois and Mom Eunice, they had a great impact on Timothy's life. Um, it's, it's suggested and possibly uh, this happened that Grandma Lois had become a follower of Jesus um, at Pentecost, possibly, or maybe at one of the time preaching uh, missionary journeys of Paul. And so it began with Grandma Lois, and then it was passed down to, uh, to Mom Eunice, and then on to Timothy. Acts chapter 16, verse 1 tells us that Timothy's mom was a believer. Um, it says his dad was a Greek. In other words, his dad was not a Christian. So spiritually speaking, dad really wasn't a part of the picture uh, for that formation of Timothy's life. So Timothy, he's a third generation believer. Um, and he had been greatly influenced by grandma and by, by his mom. And Paul recognizes this. And he sees a couple of influences that really shaped him. And I want us to look at those today. The first influence is this, a sincere faith. That influence of sincere faith. Go back to 2 Timothy 1.5. Notice what, what Paul says. He says, I've been reminded of your sincere faith. This sincere faith, this, those words sincere, it literally means without hypocrisy. Unhypocritical is what the word sincere means. So hypocrite in the Greek means actor or stage player, meaning not real. That's what hypocrite means. And, and Paul says, I see your, not just your faith, but your sincere faith. Your unhypocritical, no hypocrisy 
faith. And this faith to Timothy was real all the time, everywhere. It wasn't just talked about, it was lived out. If you're willing to follow Paul the Apostle and, and follow his teaching, Paul's spent a good chunk of his ministry in prison. You know, so if you're willing to follow someone, follow someone like that, you have a sincere faith in, in Jesus Christ. One pastor, I read this the other day, one pastor had been preaching on the importance of daily Bible reading. And when the pastor and his wife were invited to a church member's home, the pastor's wife noticed that the woman of the house had written on the kitchen calendar for that date, pastor and missus over for dinner, dust all the Bibles. (laughs) Another pastor, after he had tea with a church member, said, I am so glad to see the way that you are living. Oh, pastor, replied the man, if you want to know how we really live, you should come back when you're not here. A hypocritical faith, if that is an even, even is anything, can put on the mask, can be the actor, can put on the mask and appears sincere, but it's set aside when it's home or away from church. This sincere faith had been modeled to Timothy by his mom and by his grandma. It was an uncontaminated faith, and it was genuine, and this really shaped Timothy. I love how Paul even says later on in verse 5, he says, I'm persuaded or I'm convinced that this faith now lives within you. It lives in you. Like he possessed this faith. It wasn't just talked about, but man, it was a part of his life. I do want to say this today. Sincere faith does not imply perfection. Get this, okay? It does not imply perfection, but it does imply reality with God. You don't have to be perfect to have sincere faith, but you do need to walk it out. Walk out your faith. So this faith of Lois and Eunice, it dwelt with them. It was in their homes. It was inside them. It was wherever they went. If our faith lives within us, it goes wherever we go. It's not just for right now, but the moment you leave this place and you go out to Cracker Barrel, wherever you're going to eat to celebrate with mom, uh, that faith is, should be with you there too on how you treat everybody. That, that faith is real all the time. And I question if our faith is only on Sundays, if it's even faith at all. We need to have the faith that goes beyond Sunday morning, beyond a Wednesday night, and it's with us wherever. And listen, I am the first to admit that I am not perfect. The fact that I'm standing up here today being able to present God's word to you is very humbling because I know my life. I'm glad I don't have to show it to all of you either, by the way. But I know that I'm not perfect, but but I want to have a sincere faith. Sincere faith means this, that you have believed in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you walk in reality with Him every day, that you spend time in God's Word and you spend time in prayer. That's a sincere faith. Sincere faith means that you uh, confront yourself with the Scriptures. Sincere faith means you align your life up with this book. Sincere faith means that you seek forgiveness. Sincere faith means that you Give forgiveness. Sincere faith means that you develop godly character. And I want you to know this, that your sincere faith is not meant to be kept for you. Do you understand this? It's not meant to be kept for you. We have this example of Lois and Eunice passing on to Timothy. How many of you have ever been on a track team? You've been on a relay team before. You've run a race with a relay, all right? Um... For my, my, my son and Andrew Donahoe in the back, they run together for their team, and uh, they run the 4 by 8 They're a great team. They usually won almost all the races this year. And so um, the concept, obviously, is there's four runners. They each run 100 meters or 800 meters to complete the entire race. So runner number one starts with the baton, runs 800, passes off to runner number two. So usually Andrew would start off. He would run the first leg, hand off to my son Ethan. Ethan would run another 800 on to the runner number three, then runner number four. The whole time this baton is being handed off. The whole time, that's that's the goal, is to be able to not just complete your part of the race, but then to hand it off to someone else. How weird would it be if Andrew is running and he completes his race and takes the baton and he just goes off and sits on the side and watches Ethan run. Ethan's like, wait a minute, I need the baton too. You know, we're we're, we're in this together. Grandma Lois started with that baton. 
She handed it off to Eunice, and then Eunice handed it off to Timothy. And they didn't forget their faith once it was handed off. They continued, but the, the goal of sincere faith is meant to be handed off. Hypocritical faith, like I said, if that is anything, it can't be handed off into sincere faith. The faith that Timothy's grandma and mom impacted him to have a sincere faith. So listen, live our lives, let's live our lives with sincere faith. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to come in here with all your, everything in order in order to come into this church or to have a faith with Jesus. You just have to be real with him, all right? You have to live your life out trusting him. Let's live our lives without hypocrisy. So, so for our sake, we can have salvation through Jesus because there's people that we're influencing also. People are watching you, whether you realize it or not, and they see that sincerity of your faith, and, and honestly, they want something about it. They, they want to know more about it. They want it. So the question to ask yourself is this. Do you have this kind of faith? Do you have that sincere faith? And if so, are you handing it off? Are you passing it along to the next generation? So sincere faith was modeled for Timothy, and also the powerful truth of God's Word. That's another thing that, that was influenced onto his life. Uh, turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Paul is still speaking to Timothy. And um, he's recalling not only the impact of his mom and grandma, but he says this about God's Word. He says, starting in verse 14, But as for you, Timothy, continue in what you've learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you've learned it. Not only grandma and mom, but also Paul. In verse 15, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures. They're able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Clearly God's word had impacted grandma and mom, hadn't it? And it had trickled down into Timothy. They modeled to Timothy what the powerful truth of God's word was. Timothy was taught scriptures from infancy as a young boy. Jewish tradition tells us that most likely it's the father that takes the lead in this for the children and for the boys especially. Uh, But since Acts 16 verse 1 tells us that his father was really not a part of the picture spiritually, mom and grandma took took that that lead in that. And also Jewish tradition tells us that a boy would start receiving instructions in the Torah in the Old Testament beginning at age 5, most likely memorizing it. And so this began at a very young age, and it continued because it was important to mom and grandma. Deuteronomy chapter 6, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Uh, chapter, chapter 6, verse 4, Deuteronomy. Uh, Lois, Eunice, and Timothy, they studied the scriptures diligently. They knew what Moses had said to Israel, what God had said through Moses to Israel. In Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strengths. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Okay, so he's speaking to the individuals, but then he takes it to the next level. He says, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them, these scriptures, as symbols on your hands and bind them on your forehead. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Moses is given a charge to the parents. He's admonishing the parents to discuss God's word in the home, among the children, to allow the word of God to guide their minds, to guide their hearts, to guide their lives as they work and as they go about their day. They were to take the word of God seriously and to be sure that the next generation did also. You read a few times in the Old Testament where it says, do this because uh, your, your children's children, you know, will be affected by this. Th- this is a generational thing that we need to think about. It's not just for us. It's meant to be handed off. So parents, we need to be the primary source of teaching God's word. We need to, parents. And I say that as an encouragement not to condemn anybody here whatsoever, but we have to take the lead in this. We have to take the lead and not to pass the responsibility onto someone else or even the church. The church is here to reinforce that, to teach, but we as parents need to to be the, the, the provider of that within our homes and to lead our children in that. But parents, we also need to realize that we're not the only influence either. I'm sure you've come to realize that by now. 
But look at the life of Timothy. Who was writing to Timothy? It's Paul. Paul the apostle, a godly man. He was influencing Timothy. I'm guessing mom and grandma had prayed that that would take place, that somebody would continue in that influence. So pray for godly mentors. Pray for teachers and pastors and and the small group leaders that work with your children here at church. Pray for them that God would uh, fill them with the Holy Spirit, that they would be able to communicate God's word clearly just like you are in the home. Listen, your children will grow in sincere faith When they see and they understand the powerful truth of God's word, your children will grow in sincere faith. When they see and understand the powerful truth of God's word. And listen, let me pause for a moment. I understand that that there's parents here that they have uh, lived a life of sincere faith and and their children maybe are not following the Lord or they've they've stepped away, and I understand that. But I, so so I say this with with caution too, because this isn't just, this is not a cover all for every situation. Because at some point, we make the decision for ourselves, right? But I do want to encourage you parents, don't quit. Don't, don't stop being that influence in your, in your child's life. Don't stop praying for them. Because they, they need it, whether they voice it to you or not. So we can't pass on what we don't possess. If it's not possessed within you, you can't pass it on. If, we're not, if you and I are not daily modeling for our kids the importance of God's word, what's being taught here at church, their faith is going to be built on sand. If all it is is Sunday mornings, everyone, if all it is is that we hear God's word right now, we're going to compartmentalize our faith. And then all of a sudden when we leave, okay, check that off, we're done. And then what happens tomorrow when the storms of life come? Last time I checked, the storms of life don't happen just on Sundays when you're in church. They happen all the time, anytime, wherever, right? And so when we build our life upon sand and the storms come, we're going to be, we're going to drift away. We're, our, our foundation is going to go away because it's not built upon God's word. We need God's word as the bedrock of our life. So let me ask us, do your kids see the importance of God's word in your life? Do your kids see how God's word has changed you? Do your kids see God's God's word is evident in your life? Or is ESPN and Fixer Upper and Hoarders and Tidying Up more evident? We need to, this is very practical. We got to read the Bible to our kids. Uh, Joshua 24 verse 15 um, if you haven't studied the book of Joshua, it's, it's such a cool book. I'd encourage you to read through it. It's got some great, great stories. But um, at the end of the book, Joshua is speaking to um, the people. And in verse 24, verse 15, chapter 24, verse 15, he says, But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you're going to serve, whether it's the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in the land whom you are living. But as for me... At my house, we serve the Lord. And I have to challenge us that today. Listen, if you're going to choose to serve the gods of this world, or are you going to choose to serve the God of, of the world? My house, I decided a long time ago, my house is going to serve the Lord. And, and uh, I, I choose to do that every day, not in perfection. But I, I challenge you with that. We need to read the Bible to our kids as soon as possible. And here's the deal. Please don't make the excuse. Well, my kids are older now. It's going to seem weird. Like we haven't started that tradition. We haven't started that habit yet. Or maybe they're teenagers and it's like, it's just a little awkward. I don't know what to do. Pause for a moment. What have we just done here today? We've read God's word. Those of you who went to Sunday school, maybe you, you read God's word. And you can talk about it there. So why does changing the location and the person reading it Make it awkward all of a sudden. Listen, we have to be the primary resource. So I I encourage you, parents. I challenge you, parents. I implore you, please, continue to make in that habit or start. But at some point, they have to see that it's important to us. If your kids are old enough to read, help them create this this time, this habit of time of reading up by themselves. But find out where they're reading. I try to do this every once in a while with my kids. Where did you read today? And then I try to read also. And then we can talk about it because we know some of the same things. Um, find a good devotional for, for your kids. Um, or find a devotional for you as a parent or grandparent to go through with your kids or grandkids. And then talk about it. Dig deeper. If you, if you need some ideas for devotionals, see... Um, Any one of our pastors, Pastor Courtney, Pastor Zach, Pastor Luke, Pastor Austin, anybody, uh, for ideas on devotionals. Um, 
the point is this. We need to be more intentional, don't we? We need to be so intentional in, in what we do. If your kids are grown, they're out of the house, meet them up for coffee, open up the Word of God, read, read it together, just talk about it over a phone call, over FaceTime, whatever it may be. Um, and here's the deal. I, I talked to someone after the first service, and they're like, you know what, I, I'm pretty new to this faith, and, and I don't really understand the Bible very much. And, and I want to say this to anybody out here that feels the same way. Don't discredit what the Holy Spirit can do through you. You want to grow. Your kids will see you growing. They'll see that hunger. And listen, there's, there's something powerful about the Holy Spirit that can do something that we can't. And He can teach you. He can mature you. But in the same time, He's... The same Holy Spirit is speaking to your child. And so the Holy Spirit can give you wisdom like you've never thought before as, as, as you allow Him to and as you open up your, sp- your heart to Him. But my point, like I said, is that we need to be more intentional. So let's dig deeper. All right? Before we close today, I want to say this. At some point, every one of us here, no matter what age we are, at some point, we have to go beyond Jesus is my friend forever. And we need to know the condition of our heart and why Jesus died on the cross. It's got to go beyond just a a nice phrase, a saying, and we have to live it out. We have to realize that without Jesus, um, there is no substitute on the cross. Without Jesus, there is, you know, no forgiveness. Without Jesus, there's no purity that, that we can attain on our own. So because of Jesus, we have that. And so at some point, we have to dig deep personally, for our sake, but also for those that we're influencing. And here's why knowing God's truth is powerful. If you still have your Bibles, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, Paul says this, all scripture is God-breathed. It's useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting. How many times does our pride get in the way? And we got to have, like, you're thankful for people to, like, kind of smack you upside the head and say, come on, get it together. This is what God's Word does to us. It rebukes us. It corrects us. It trains us in righteousness for this reason, so that we can be equipped for every good work. It doesn't say that you read it because you're perfect. You read it to draw closer, become more like Jesus because of it. And jump down to chapter 4, starting in verse 3. This Paul is speaking to Timothy, and here's why knowing the powerful truth is so important. He says this, The time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They're going to turn their ears away from the truth, and they're going to turn aside to myths. Paul is speaking to Timothy. This is in the New Testament. Shortly after Jesus has left this earth, Paul is speaking this. If people are departing the faith back then, don't you think it's probably still happening now? We need God's truth. We can't just run to every wind of teaching just because it sounds good. If it doesn't line up with God's word, it's probably nothing we should be listening to. We need God's truth to, light, to, to point us in the correct direction. Warren Wearsby is a uh, commentator uh, on God's word and, and, and uh, wrote a lot of commentary. And he says this about what we just read. The time would come, and I believe it's been here for a long time, when most people won't put up with healthy doctrine of the word of God. They're going to have carnal desires for religious novelties. Because of their itching ears, they would accumulate teachers who will satisfy their cravings for things that disagree with God's truth. And here's the result. A congregation full of comfortable, professing Christians listening to a comfortable religious talk that contains no Bible doctrine. And these people become prey because their lives lack a foundation in the Word of God. And Paul warns Timothy, and I warn us, we need God's Word as the bedrock of our souls. We need it. Worship team, would you join me? Paul greatly influenced Timothy's life. But think about this, guys. Paul the bit, the, as much influence as he had on Timothy, would we still read about Timothy in the same light or in the same way as, as we would if his mom and grandma hadn't picked up the baton and ran? Would we? Probably not. If your mom or your grandma or a motherly influence, if, if they have had a, a great spiritual impact on your life, continue in what they've taught you. Continue in what they've modeled for you. 
carry out that baton so that you are passing it on to the next generation because they were willing to pass it on to you. So now you live so you can pass it on to the next generation. If you did not have that spiritual impact in your life from a mom or a grandma or motherly influence, start. Grandma Lois had to start, right? You be the one. You pick up that baton and you start. Timothy was only three generations removed from this starting with his grandma. So moms were so grateful. With the, from the bottom of my heart I say this, moms, we're so grateful for the influence you have on our lives. I wish we could get mom goggles so we could see life the way that you do because we're so grateful. And moms, think about this. We may not verbally say it, but the best way that we can say thank you is by continuing in what you have modeled for us. That's the best way that your children and your grandchildren can say thank you. So just know today that you are appreciated, you're loved, and when you see your child or your grandchild uh, live out and model out maybe a spiritual impact that you've had on their life, that's just the Holy Spirit's way of saying, you're doing it right, you're doing a good job. And I do wanna say this before we pray. If you're being critical of yourself right now, whether you're a mom or not, please stop. That is not the heart of Jesus. The heart of Jesus is to love you, to help you, to guide you. He came into this world to save us, not to uh, condemn us and make us feel like we're the worst people in the world. He came to show truth and show that there is a way and it's Him. And so please today, listen, if you think, man, I have done a horrible job as a parent, as a mom, as a dad uh, of modeling that or even for my own sake spiritually, Please, don't leave here today feeling like that. I want you to know that today you can, you can start or you can continue or you can pick up that baton and, that you've dropped maybe and you can continue in that race. So please know the heart of Jesus. He's with you. He wants to help you. He wants to guide you. And I do want you to know this, that somebody here today, you're deciding, you've probably already decided right now that you're gonna pick up that baton for the first time and you might be the first one in your family. Think of this, generations from, will come and they'll look back on your decision today and they'll say, thank you. Timothy was so grateful for Grandma Lois. Whether you're a male or female, there's, there's a Grandma Lois that's picking up that baton today and you're running that race. Your children and grandkids will look back and be so grateful. Would you stand with me as we pray? As we pray, let's just take a moment because I realize Mother's Day is painful for a lot of people and for, for a variety of reasons. And I do want to pray for, for those especially. Jesus, we lift up those that today is a, is a tough day. It brings back hard memories. Would you please, by your strength and by your love, minister in a way that no one else can? Bring, bring purpose from, throughout today. Lord, we reflect on, on all of this and we do say thank you for being so faithful even during the difficult times. There's someone here today or maybe, maybe many people that are choosing to pick up that baton for the first time or, can, or begin that race again. Uh, the, the sincere faith is, is yours now and you're choosing in your heart. And I wanna take a moment before we sing to pray for those. Father, we lift up those that today they're making that decision in their heart to follow you, to continue that sincere faith or start today for the very first time. Would you let their faith be so strong in you, God? Minister to them right now where they're at and as they make it a decision to follow you. Not a decision to follow a church or a man, but to follow you, Jesus Christ, that in their heart as they pray and they, they cry out to you, that you would reach them and meet them where they're at, God. And as they walk out of this place, help them to know that you are with them through all of this and that you are faithful. We place our faith, we place our trust in you and you alone, Jesus. 
And Father, I lift up every one of us here, Lord, as we are, are continuing this race, this sincere faith, that our lives would be grounded upon your word, the powerful truth of you, O oh God, that you would help us and that you would guide us in every aspect. Whether we're a mom, a, fa- a dad, a son, or a father, would you help us? We love you, Jesus. Can we make this our, our prayer today as we sing, I build my life?